Welcome back to another inside T-Rex behind the scenes video. And I apologize at how long it's taken me to get around to shooting this video, especially since the last video was actually a cliffhanger. The software is really problematic. I'd only use this device if you have the ability to rebuild the model completely in another piece of software, which I do. And we can talk about that in another video. But don't worry, all will be revealed. So right off the bat, the software that we use to go from a 3D scan of an actual firearm to a 3D model that we can cut a holster mold out of is Lightwave 3D. Now, Lightwave 3D, as you may have guessed from the title, is what most people would consider the wrong tool for the job. And the reason for that is because it's not a CAD tool, it's not a machinist's tool, it is an animation tool. So here's the difference between uh, a CAD program and an animation program. The CAD program, something like Fusion 3D or SolidWorks, is going to use uh, solid objects, and there's going to be parametric operations made to those, those shapes. So things like fillets or fillets or chamfers or bevels, uh, those things are going to be dimensionally perfect and accurate and probably even going to contain tool data for the CNC milling operations that are going to be performed on those actual models and that way you're going to be able to machine complex uh, machine parts uh, that come out completely perfect. Now animation software on the other hand, something like Maya or Blender or Lightwave, um, those are going to use surface based modeling and those surfaces are going to be meshes of things like polygons or patches. Uh, surfaces that can be really easily textured or subdivided or deformed and that allows for much more realistic animations for movies and video games. And that's why some people would say that Lightwave is the wrong tool for the CNC work that we are actually doing. But it can still do the job. Let's load one of our 3D scans into Modeler here. And you can see this is a scan of this object here. Uh, a huge amount of detail on this 1911 has been picked up by the EinScan SP scanner. And as we zoom in, uh, you can see the individual polygons that the scanner has generated. This is uh, 2.3 million polygons. And one of lightweight strengths is that it's actually, uh, you can see, very happy to throw around uh, over 2 million polygons in this scan. And uh, that's something that a CAD package might actually have trouble with. I'm actually going to clean that up a little bit, but we still can't really work directly with this scan. Uh, you can see that there are some holes inside of it. There's some, some issues with the way that it was scanned and the way that it was stitched. I really need to build something um, that is cleaner on top of this. And the other really cool thing that we can do with our scanner is we can combine several different scans of slightly different guns to see what uh, sort of model we need to build that might support all of them. So here is a uh, the regular 1911 that we just scanned. Uh, here is a Springfield operator. Here is an EMP, and here they are all combined together, and interesting to see how they dimensionally work out. But to start out, let's build uh, our actual clean mesh on the 1911. I, uh, I like to start with the slide. Um, it's the simplest shape to begin with. In some ways, it's the most important for holster making. It's also very easy to double check all of my measurements with calipers as I go. This would be a great place to use uh, CAD software because this radius right here is a perfect cylinder. And so in a CAD package, we can make sure that that stays a perfect cylinder. All the lines stay shaped perfectly straight. Um, CAD software uh, is great at primitives and great at developing something like this. 
But LineWave has proper measurements and exact numeric stuff as well, so you can see that I'm able to type in exactly the move that I want to create what I'm going for. And modeling for holsters is a little bit different than modeling for mechanical parts. For example, I'm not going to create this ejection port because I want to create a smooth shape that the gun will fit into once it's an actual holster. But I am going to mark where that ejection port is so that later on, if I have anything that I need to measure from the ejection port, I will be able to do so. The back of the slide is also not super important since the holster always gets cut off before then. So now that our slide is done, let's move on to the frame. And uh, looking at this frame, you can see that there's some complex curves to it, which are actually, I believe, going to be easier and simpler for me to design in LightWave. But the main reason I'm using LightWave is it's what I have the most time in. My background is in uh, visual effects and animation for film and television. I've been doing that for a lot of years. And when we switched over to doing a lot of CNC work uh, at T-Rex and had to learn how to do that, it made sense to do our modeling uh, in a package that I already was familiar with. Visual effects in movies uh, all used to be done with models, puppets, matte paintings, and optical compositing. And then when computers came along, people said, oh, that's the wrong tool for this job. But then computer graphics started to be used in movies, and that worked out pretty well eventually. And the computers making the graphics were really, really expensive. And then along came the Amiga, which was a home computer that was powerful enough to do pretty high-end animation. And the Hollywood computer people said, that's the wrong tool for this job. But then the video toaster came along. The toaster captures all the power and all the quality of a $100,000 network video studio and puts it in your Amiga for less than $2,500. That's incredible. It is incredible. Now, its animation tools were pretty crude and simple. Um, for reference, this was in 1993, and Steven Spielberg was just honing cutting-edge Hollywood CGI in Jurassic Park. And to be honest, a home computer running Lightwave really was the wrong tool for that. But that didn't stop Spielberg from buying a whole studio full of video toasters that same year to produce all the CGI for his TV series, uh, Sequest DSV. Sorry for that rabbit trail, but the point is that LightWave started out as the wrong tool for Hollywood blockbuster visual effects, but for at least a decade it was the undisputed king of television VFX. And then it became powerful enough to be used on some Hollywood blockbusters. And after that, I'm afraid it kind of stagnated a bit, but it still let me be a part of some amazing projects. And it's letting me do this. So now we have a pretty solid 1911 shape. And you might ask yourself, why am I trying uh, to get these forms exactly right when the holster itself doesn't actually need quite this level, level of detail? And the answer is um, a little bit complicated. There's a bunch of folks that end up making uh, holster forms using CAD packages that look something like this. And to be honest, that's kind of fine. The gun will actually fit into here. The gun will actually be retained by this little bit right here. But uh, it's just not quite as effective. For starters, uh, you're going to get friction in weird hot spots. The Kydex wrapping around some of these stair steps is going to be weakened slightly. And when you want to make an inside the waistband holster, you want it to be as smooth as possible and get rid of as much bulk as you can. And that's why, and that's why we tried to build very precise models of our guns that we support. I'm gonna add a rail using this scan from the Springfield operator. that's ready for a test. The other thing that we need to do is add some blocking around all the controls, everything that sticks out 
so that we're able to get it in and out of the holster. So that's how we use LightWave to reverse engineer the 3D scans of real guns into models that are very easy to work with uh, in the computer and to machine things from. And in the next video, we'll explain the software that we use to do that. Uh, and don't worry, it's not going to be a cliffhanger. Uh, I'll tell you right now, it's Vectric Aspire. And there's two things that I really want to encourage you guys to do in this video. The first is be flexible. If the wrong tool lets you do a better job than the industry standard tool, or if it lets you work faster or cheaper while maintaining that same level of quality, then maybe it's not the wrong tool after all. So don't waste the time or the money on the things that you don't need. And the second uh, thing is be uncompromising. The only way to know if your tool is giving you sufficient quality is if you study and know what the industry standard tool can do. Uh, you need to make sure that you're not making excuses for the wrong tool if it's actually the wrong tool. So make sure that you are comparing your work to the best stuff that's out there, whether you're an animator, a holster maker, whether you're a proper machinist. Um, make sure that your tools are up to the job. Make sure that you are up to the job and uh, always be improving on what you can do and be really uncompromising when you judge your own work against the other stuff that is out there. So thank you so much for watching this video. You can like and subscribe to the bell or whatever you need to do. And uh, if you have time, I highly recommend that you go and watch the full video toaster launch video because uh, it's pretty amazing. It's new software. Yeah. It's new hardware. Hey. It's the next generation of the most successful video tool of all time. A whole new video toaster. It'll be the end of blah, blah, blah television. <laughs> the Video Toaster 4000.